the object of this session uh, is to look at some of the, uh, the challenges facing uh, service providers in the, uh, in the changing environment in the industry and, uh, and how the models might change, how they may respond and what exactly the principal challenges uh, will be. Uh, before we jump into that, I'd like to give our panellists uh, a moment or two just to introduce themselves and their company. Andrew? Yeah, hi everyone. So, um, good morning uh, again in Hawaii. So it must be uh, uh, many years we meet here, so at least it's my 18 years in Hawaii. So uh, I'm Andrew, Andrew Kwok, uh, the president of the Hutchison Global Communication International. So basically we are running uh, an international uh, global services. So later on I'll explain a little bit uh, how we evolve along the line, uh, other than the traditional business, what are the new services or, and all that. And other than the international uh, fixed line business that I'm running, I also represent Hutchison Telecom Hong Kong to run the international mobile business. Uh, the international mobile business in conjunction with our 11 mobile operations around the world um, for the traffic handling, customer handling, no matter for corporate customer, MVNO, OTT and all this. Again, I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, my third role is uh, to handle all the industrial carrier, local carrier, mobile carrier, for their requirements in Hong Kong and also in the fixed line business. Thanks a lot. Anthony. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Hope you're having a good conference so far. Um, like Andrew, um, uh, this is my 18th year at PTC. <laughs> See, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, and the show uh, continues to get better. Hopefully, we can add a little bit to that today. Um, I am the chief marketing officer at Level 3 Communications. We're a Denver, Colorado, USA-based Fortune 500, uh, Fortune 500 telecommunications company. Um, we have about a uh, pro forma 8,000 US, 8 billion US dollar uh, top line, excuse me. Um, we have uh, roughly 13,000 employees around the globe. Uh, we own and operate one of the largest optical IP networks on the planet, and we have a full suite of IP solutions to serve enterprise and uh, carrier customers and government customers securely. Um, my, my team and I were responsible for product development, uh, product management, global customer experience, and corporate marketing for our company. And um, I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today because the, uh, the, the abstract and the description of this panel you know, that John wrote um, and talking about the disruption that digitization can cause the telecommunications industry, you can remove the term telecommunications and put almost any industry in its place. Whether it's financial services, whether it's media, whether it's logistics, whether it's transportation, um, or, or, or even state and local governments for that matter. And um, you know, as a result of that, I think it, it, it causes all of us to need to look mu that much more closely at the needs of our customers and how we can partner with them to help them achieve their business models. That's a great segue, thank you, because uh, I think you're right, there is uh, manifestly consensus about the fact that we are in a, a very disruptive and, and in, a increasingly disruptive uh, environment. Uh, the, the whole theme of PTC 16 uh, you know, is redolent of that and all of the, the attendant threats and opportunities uh, that, that come with it. So there's consensus on, on the fact that things will need to be reimagined, re but perhaps not on, on exactly what direction we're going to take. Uh, I mean, at the beginning of uh, this conference, Hugh Bradlow gave, a, yeah, I think, a very erudite and well-argued uh, view of how things are going to work out. He talked about service providers learning to uh, offer you know, friction-free services uh, rather than sticky solutions and, uh, and how service providers would uh, find themselves moving to provide evaluated uh, cloud-based uh, interface uh, on one side with uh, companies on, and on the other side with, uh, with their customers. All of this in an environment where uh, uh, phone numbers are, are, are disappearing, uh, where the Internet of Things is bursting towards 50 billion devices, where a swarm of loons increasingly blocks the sunlight and the, the buzzing of drones going about their business becomes almost insufferable. Uh, so that's one view of how uh, the model might, might change. But equally, others might say, well, hang on, you've got beyond the network 
services, attractive ones coming over the top, uh, threatening to put service providers in a position of running a commoditised uh, you know, connectivity uh, product and, and taking away the primacy of their relationship with their customers. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I'd, <laughs> I'd like to hear what, uh, what you guys think. Uh, it might be neither of those. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. Uh, I agree. Uh, I still remember the first time we talked about the, uh, the flat of the ODT was uh, around five years ago here uh, in PVC. So during that time, uh, obviously, the people are talking about uh, how we should uh, protect our interests and all this. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, several ingredients that they still can be, have to rely on us. For example, network, uh, operation, performance, network development, locational-based service during that time, uh, five years ago, locational-based service, building relationship, and all this, we are still in the upper hand or whatsoever. But if you take a look uh, throughout these several years of time, so network, so the ODD start to buy up and build up their own network already. Mm -hmm. Other than that, when you talk about locational services, I use Google's map more than any, anything else. Okay. And unluckily, when I use the service, I remember Google's map instead of remember which mobile carrier I'm using. Okay. Carrier building, uh, I mean on the building relationship, is already a lot of uh, building engine around the world cooperating with the ODD. But having said that, I think we passed the stage of talking about how we resist them, but all of us and try to, try to embrace them at this moment. Everyone say that this ODD is my customer, that ODD is my customer. But if we really sit down to take a look, are they really our customer or not? I think it's half. We are providing the IAS service to them, for example, data center, connectivities, and all this. But are we in that kind of business? I think not yet. And that is a lot of other things that we can do. So to answer the question, I think we are in a stage of evolving ourselves, so to speak that we are a fixed line or wireless or, or, or fixed line infrastructure-based carrier. We are half moving in from against them to embrace them, but we are only midway in involving in their business. Where ours is a telecommunication business, there is a community service or communication service. So I, I don't want to drag on, but later on I may give out some example that what should be and, and what are the opportunity of contribution from the carrier in involving ourselves a little bit more into the OTT business, where at this moment we're only midway in providing some infrastructure-based business, but not in-depth enough. I, I, I think that's a, a, a great point. At what, you know, back up just a second. OTT, um, our company, we love, we love OTT. We love the, the trend. We love the the dynamism of, 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 uh, of what the segment has, has afforded us. And that's largely because of a, of, a, of a native CDN capability and a broadcast capability that we have from an infrastructure standpoint. And if you, and if you believe the statistics that are out there, um, they're, they're, actually, they're actually quite uh, profound. Um, I, I, was, I was looking at one recently where almost 71% uh, of, of customers have been, you know, the OTT players have penetrated roughly 71% um, versus uh, paid, that's roughly 77, 78%. So it's almost at par, you know, with, with, with paid channels. So I, I agree with Andrew, this is, this is a well mature, you know, trend that's, that's, that's continuing. One of the things that we run into a lot though is um, everyone in, in, in many different industries now believes that they have the ability to move into this space. And, and, and you know, we see, we see a lot of times, we see folks that have content, and you know, one, thing, one thing that's very uh, public, uh, very public partner of ours is Major League Baseball. And uh, Major League Baseball has phenomenal content in, you know, in North America, and in, some, and in some countries outside of North America as well, for that matter. Um, but but that's, a, that's an arrangement where, um, you know, uh, MLB knew that they have content, they have expertise in ad placement, and they wanted to find a partner that knew how to run a content distribution network, that knew how to operate and manage data centers and infrastructure on a global scale and to do both in a secure fashion. One of the things that we increasingly run into though with this topic is that folks aren't sure where they should stop on the continuum. 
And you know, we find ourselves from a uh, solutions approach and an account a management approach very often counseling some of our clients and saying, do you really want to run a network? Or are you in the content business? Are you in the media business? Are you in the entertainment business? Stick to your knitting and you know, let, us, let us help you do that. So that's, that's kind of the rub. And I think that's probably the next phase of what we're going to see with, with, with that trend. There is an inherent you know, uh, potential for instability and conflict uh, it, where that, that ground and the boundaries around it are, uh, are still being defined. Uh, you're in transition, uh, and, and that, that can be the most vulnerable time when you're changing your pants and <laughs> the threat appears. Uh, how long do you think you've got to complete the, the transition, to complete the, the journey to a, whatever your new model will be? Okay, thanks, John. I think it is a very difficult question. Okay, so on one hand, I try to I try to uh, qualify the transition first. When, when we are talking about we imagining the communication business, frankly speaking, I still see that a very important piece of our business will stay as it is. When you compare the ODD business with our so-called traditional business you always see that the ODT are going into a big population, standardization, this kind of model. You cannot uh, ask them to go to a country who only got uh, maybe uh, three or four million uh, people, no matter how is their business uh, uh, going. But having said that, for our traditional business, our corporate customer, they may want to build a factory in that country, they may want to have a telecom service into that country, I think what I mean is that for that piece of business, I think it will be still untouched. But however, we obviously have to evolve that. Okay? So taking away this piece, another piece is for those big ODT opportunity which is coming into our doorstep. In the past, we regard as competition. Now we embrace them. And then we're talking about evolution. Uh, my, my timeline for this will be ongoing, only to the, to the reason is that um, our traditional service is not as good as the OTT service. Some of them, take for example, SMS against WhatsApp instant message. If we are as good as them, we already win over them Why they're taking away the business. So low cry wolf on this one. So for this type of a traditional business, I think we need to involve, evolve. But on the other hand, we are providing our infrastructure to them, which is still, I think, is not good enough. Our plan and also what our action is nowadays is that other than to welcome them into our network, provide them with services, help them to launch the service, I think we need to change our business model from this is the telecom service that I have. Okay, you want which one, you pick it. I, we try to reverse this model too. You tell me what kind of service you want, and I'll bundle internally and give it to you. Mm -hmm. So the comparison is, in the past, an opportunity come into just like a restaurant. They sit down there, and then the kitchen will say that, I have chicken, beef, cooked in this way, you take it. It's just like our MPLS service, our SMS service, our voice service, our GEPL service, our list line service, you take what? The best I can do is to bundle this and give it to you, but still, the fundamental is this kind of business, it's services. I think in the future, the demand will not be the same. We have to chop our business even further into smaller pieces so that when the opportunity comes, we tell them what do you want, and then we'll bundle all these pieces and give it and to serve them. So, answer your question, what will be this process? I don't think this process will end in a short period of time. Only to the reason is, if we are heading to this and doing this, that means we are really involved into the OTD business, stepping in the doorstep, because the relationship and also the involvement will be much deeper than nowadays. So I hope and I wish it will be an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, the previous session uh, focused on, uh, on the, what's happening in the cloud space uh, and the, the different models, be it 
uh, private cloud, public cloud, uh, multiple clouds, hybrid. Uh, can you talk a little about uh, how you think the, uh, the service providers will, will fare in, in the hybrid cloud uh, environment? You know, how, how do you maintain uh, customer intimacy? Uh, you know, what, what's, the, uh, what's the future hold on that front? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start that. Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to address that. I guess, I guess the first, the, we always try, I always try to remind my team and, and, and the folks in my company to start with what a customer is trying to solve for. And you look at some of the use cases that exist, um, you know, in a, in a hybrid scenario, and you know whether it's a gaming company that, you know, wants to have an amazing, you know, low latency experience, very very close to their users, but has to take care of all of the PCI transactions in a different data center or a private data center, for example. Um, you know, that's one use case. Um, another use case, you know, might be an enterprise. And we're seeing this increasingly where they want to access um, their productivity apps in Azure, for example. They want to do their, their, their dev test and runtime development in, in the Amazon cloud. And perhaps they want to um, develop some big data analytics solutions with, with GCI. You know, there's a number of, of different use cases that are out there that customers are trying to solve for you know, with, with, with hybrid cloud uh, networking. Um, th this is a trend that is another one, um, you know, 80, 90% of the enterprises that we work with today either have started or have plans to start down this path. It's only just the very, very beginning, right, in terms of where they'll ultimately end up. But I think the implication for us, for service providers, um, is, is not dissimilar to where Andrew ended up with how they're evolving their portfolio to serve their customers around bundles. If we want to mimic or we want to support the reason why enterprises are moving into a hybrid cloud scenario, we have to be mindful of that as it relates to our network development. So what does that mean? You know, we, we, want, we want to be able to have a, a network um, that um, is on demand. We want to have a network um, where a client has the ability to pay by the, by the drink, as it were. Um, we need to be mindful of the security approach yep. in the hybrid environment. Um, we believe that it's no longer appliance-based. It's, it's increasingly, if not absolutely, network-based. And then the fourth thing associated with that that we, we have to take on ownership for is that hybrid networking and hybrid cloud development, and I'll say the two in one sentence, but they are two very different things, they require an ecosystem approach. So it's incumbent upon us to have connectivity and, and to be connected um, in a very agile and secure fashion to multiple CSPs to support the use cases that I just, that I just referenced. Do you want Can to add in something? So I, I totally agree with Anthony. So he, he hit right on the nail. So our observation is the same, but just to add in one point is that um, the public cloud, so no matter you call it a, a surprise or whatsoever, I almost gave up, <laughs> almost, <laughs> OK? <laughs> uh, because I think the public cloud is just like what I said. Uh, it needs a, a very big scale, very standardized, and how you can beat Amazon, Microsoft are true, Google, those kind of public, OK? Having said that, I totally agree with Anthony is that for us carrier, when we are managing a hybrid cloud, the private cloud piece is something that we can provide and we can differentiate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Anthony talked about the security. Yes, absolutely. The security is one thing that we can beat the public. Okay? On the other hand, you have solution base. You got to provide a total solution. And other than that, the private the private cloud and the public cloud cannot be disintegrated, and carry is providing the whole network, although the handling of the public and also the private are not the same, but they're still riding on the network. We do have a responsibility to be the concentrator of the public and private, but only the public cloud layer is served up by the public cloud. That is. So, so that's why I totally agree with you. Hmm. Well, uh, other trends. Uh, 
when I when I first came to uh, PTC, which I think was around 1993, uh, we we already uh, knew what SDN was, uh, but we weren't excited about it because it only indicated that your your car was neither a, a pickup nor a convertible; it was simply a sedan. But these days, uh, there's an enormous amount of hype around uh, both SDN and, and uh, network function uh, virtualization. Uh, and I must admit, I, I don't really understand exactly what that technology is doing today uh, for customers and how rapidly it's, it's uh, being taken up and what it can do in the future. Um, perhaps, uh, Anthony, could you start us off with some thoughts on where that's going? Yeah, John, and I'll link it to the previous topic of, of hybrid cloud. And um, I, I do think that, um, and I don't mean to offend any, any equipment suppliers in, in the audience, I do think that there has been and continues to be a tremendous amount of hype, but it's getting better, thank you very much, um, um, around the practicality of, 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 of implementing SDN um, for a number of reasons. Um, in a greenfield approach, um, absolutely. You know, if you have the luxury of starting fresh with a new BSS and a new LSS um, and, and a new inventory system, it's wonderful mapping every network element and being able to automate you know, your, your, your interfaces to a customer and to your factory. Very, very few of us have that luxury. Um, however, for new product instances, um, you know, I, I, I will say that um, you know, there, there are very practical use cases to link back what the requirements are for enterprises in a hybrid cloud to what SDN functionality affords you. For example, um, you know, if, if you have the ability to uh, develop um, a, a, an offer, and this is what we've done on, on a global scale at level three, um, our, our MEF 2.0 Ethernet offer is actually SDN enabled with a, um, a series of services that we refer to as adaptive network control. Okay. And, and what this allows a client to do is to pre-program their network based on certain thresholds to scale up and scale down and scale out based on business conditions and do that in, an ex in a completely automated fashion so that they don't have to speak to anyone back into our OSS. Where, where things, and, and that's available today and, and, and we've been able to do that on a, on a global scale. Where things get a little light for, for me still is, is NFV and you know the notion of spinning up and spinning down services on a real-time basis and mapping a, a network-based firewall to a CDN instance just because a customer has called that you know that's a different kettle of fish that's a different undertaking and so you know I think that's a little bit further away I, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will come but um, I think, I think I draw the line between those two. And, and frankly, John, what we've seen in our company because of the scale is that when it comes to NFV, the economics still don't work because we're able to develop point solutions more cost effectively because of the scale of our network than, than virtualized solutions. Uh, ultimately, though, the two technologies are complementary, aren't they? In, yeah, in, in they, an ideal they absolutely are. They absolutely are. They absolutely are. We, we may jump back to cloud. We've got a question uh, that's coming from the audience, which is not a bad one. And uh, uh, it is, what challenges can you see related to, to cloud and international policy making? And uh, that, that whole standardization question around the cloud has been one that I've seen people bash into and, and fall unconscious away from. Uh, uh, do you have some thoughts on that question? Do you, uh, do you want to start? Yeah, so I think, uh Compare the compare the uh, the mobile and also the fixed and also even the international. I think the mobile is still at this moment a little bit inward looking into the country. However, for international and also for the uh, the cloud services, I think it's a pretty outward looking. So you can't avoid from uh, going into different uh, culture, different environment, different regulation, and all this. So having said that, I think. Our ongoing uh, development of our cloud service around the world is to mix and match with different environment and also different partners around the world so that we can adapt it to the uh, different environment and different situation. So this is what we have evolved. 
But do you, do you find particular challenges in the way that, uh, that existing regulation does or doesn't control uh, cloud-related issues you know, differently in, in, in the separate regions? Data, data sovereignty um, and privacy rules, um, we're, a global, we're a global provider. And we have a very, very specific policy, which is that we will play by the rules yes, in every market that we operate in, and you know, within what the local regulations need to be. And in some cases, you know, that is uh, that does inhibit our ability to scale. It may inhibit our ability to provide a, a more cost-effective service. But I think that that, you know, that's just the nature of global telecommunications. I think, frankly, it's arrogant of any carrier to think that um, that their standard is the right standard. And uh, to do, you know, good enterprise and carrier and government support, you need to be agile. This is also why uh, the international business is that exciting. That's right. Otherwise, if everything is standardized, That's it. we only need to have one look around the world That's and it. serve everything, is it? That's so we disperse our network into different pops, into different uh, policy and all this, is at, to adapt the very different variety in the world. So that's why international business exists. <laughs> agreed, agreed. It's an interesting question, John. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to incorporate it in, in, in a, a topic that we, we absolutely must talk about, I think, and, and that is the question of, uh, or the reality that whatever model uh, service providers move to uh, in, in coming years, the success of that ultimately depends on the impact on their customers and the relationship with, with the customers. Uh, and uh, you know, we've got somebody asking us, well, uh, ten can telcos offer more services uh, at the application layer and how can telcos better attract application providers? Let me wrap that in with the question of you know, how do you ensure in this transitional process that you are able to still provide an attractive customer experience and that that customer relationship uh, can endure? Uh, Andrew, would you like to start? So. Uh in this case, I'll answer your, 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 your combined question first, and it is a very interesting uh, uh, question, uh, talking about, uh, sorry, I'm getting old, so talking about uh, <laughs> more service, how, to, how Telco so can offer more service on the application layer, and how we can better attract the application provider. But i answer the, I'll answer the question first on the, uh, how to keep the loyalty with the customer, okay, so uh, in a sense. So I, I think it is a, it's a must, it's a must, but however, it is also related to this question, which I don't think the telco should be too silent and too gentle at the back. Just like what I mentioned, when I'm using a locational-based service, I remember I'm using Google's map, but I do not remember who is the underlying wireless provider. It's AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon in the US. So this is something that is a little bit insufficiency in the way that we're acting. So other than what I mentioned, the midway to provide a survey, embrace the ODT, I think we have to do exactly what the question is telling us to do, ask, go a little bit to the front, cooperate with the ODT, but plug your name into it and contribute your value. Saying that is easy, but having said that, there's some development and also within our organization, no matter on the mobile or on the fixed, other than to provide infrastructure-based service, we are doing something called digital hub. The digital hub is basically to make full use of the network, to provide service to the OTT, so that they can launch the service in a more effective manner and more portable, profitable manner. So, just to name a few, uh, what, do the o what does the ODT they don't have? Relevance. So we always call this a DPI, the packet inspection, but it's only a subset of the relevance. Relevance is the data analysis and everything, and other than that, carrier building, other than that, network development, jo network joint development. And other than that, the branding also. Because what I can see is that in the past several years, several big OTT come to the stage and seems dominant the OTT area. But now more and more OTT comes up. The, actually, the OTT is competing with each other. They need brand name, they need network, they need data in our network. They need all this to compete among themselves also. Mm. This is the time that 
we should establish something just what, like what I call the kitchen relationship and the opportunity relationship. Instead of putting up services, we chop down our, piece, our, our services into very tiny pieces and ask them, what do you want? We cook it and then we eat it. However, remember, we have to eat with them together and push our brand name to the front. It's, it's the age-old challenge, really, isn't it? Uh, you know, how much channel rub uh, do you want to generate uh, as opposed to going pure play sort of wholesale and, and, uh, and taking the risks that come with that? Yeah, and there's a, another piece of that, too. And, and, um, and, and I, uh, just so everybody doesn't think Andrew and I agree with each other all the time, I, I only agree with half of what he said. OK, that's good. Okay. Um, and, 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 and here, let me, just, let me just share a point of view. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, I think the jury's still out. It's, it's interesting to look in the industry right now and see the number of service providers, telecom providers, that are actually going in the other direction. Okay, they're, they're divesting or they're putting up for sale their data center assets and, and, and their CDNs and their, and their, and their de-investing. And there's a whole host of reasons for it. You know, it's a different skill set, it's different talent. The market has shifted. They want to move into the wireless business. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's a financial engineering arrangement they want to do. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's more news about people moving away than there is news about folks moving towards. Um, and I, I do think, however, that there is a place for, for telecom service providers, um, you know, in those end-to-end -end data center solutions where you can maintain customer primacy. But I think you need to know the role you're playing. I think you need to have the assets and or the partnerships. I think you need to have the account management skills. And I do think you need to know when you are just playing as a point solution and you do have to take a back seat or when there is a managed service or a professional service that's required where you, where you are providing that end to end. So mm -hmm. I, I think the jury's still out though. All right, thanks. We've got a quite specific question uh, here, uh, which is, uh, can level three CDN support real-time TV distribution over the internet? Uh, Andrew, you, you want to handle, oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, take, I'll take a stab at that, John, Andrew, right. if that's okay. The, sh the short answer is yes. Um, in fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and, and this is in the public domain, we actually live streamed um, uh, an NFL game through Yahoo. Um, for the first time with, uh, with, with, with great success. So we do have the capabilities to do that. Uh, another, uh, another talking point uh, that we see a lot of is the Internet of Things. Uh, we are apparently at 13 million connected devices now and uh, heading for, for 50. What, uh, can I ask both of you, what do you think uh, will be the, uh, the service provider's role in facilitating the Internet of Things and its, its development and, and emergence? And, and what are the main obstacles that you see to, to harnessing the opportunity of, of, of IoT? You know, is it in being able to access the right sort of spectrum at the right price? Uh, is it in having you know, uh, low bandwidth networks that, uh, that have the appropriate reach? Is it, is it security? Uh, is it uh, uh, the, the, the threats of fraud? Is it the conflict between privacy requirements and open data requirements? How, how do you see this playing out? Uh, Andrew. So yeah, IoT is a, is a very big topic, but uh, if it's uh, narrowed down into a service operator role and responsibility and also the challenges, I think the uh, coverage and also the standardization is both the opportunity and also the challenge. Mm. So that's why uh, in Hutchison, we, uh, we keep on investing in our mobile other than our fixed line international business. So as to enhance our coverage, but what is coverage in telecom we, we regard as eyeball in the wireless environment? Okay, we regard as eyeball. So now we accumulated to 100 million eyeball already around the world. So we'll keep on doing this. So having said that, it is not enough. If you're talking about the IoT, basically your coverage to reach a kind of economic scale, you need to have a much, much bigger coverage and eyeball in this part of the world. Basically, we are going through our own development and also going through partnership. For example, 
uh, my mobile alliance in Asia, 280 million customer. So this is all going towards this, uh, uh, this target. Having said that, on the, on the coverage, I think the standardization is also a very major, major opportunity and also challenges. Uh, in the wireless world, we have the GSMA association, yes. but in the international fixed line world, just like uh, what, I, what I mentioned in the capacity media in 2013, during the uh, executive of the year uh, award, I said, what the international fixed line operator lacking of is a, form, a little bit formal organization to standardize all this. For example, uh, we are providing some IoT services to uh, the meter company, I mean in Hong Kong, for the water yep. measurement. We are providing the uh, SIM module for the bus in Hong Kong. But however, all the requirements, the network, topology, the, even the thinking are different. So how many times mm. you can tailor make to fulfill the requirement of different IoT? Microwave is an IoT, refrigerator is another IoT, a clove is another IoT. So I think the in standardization is both an opportunity and also a challenge also. Mm. Thank you. Anthony. I, I mean, I'll uh, just, just quickly, uh, I, I, I I believe that standardization and security are, are, are key challenges. I will say, however, that in the near term, there's a number of use cases that are very attractive around the industrial internet. And I'll just share a couple of uh, experiences that we've had with customers, um, manufacturers of, of large and heavy equipment for job sites and things like that. Um, you know, not, not refrigerators yet that tell you when to order eggs and milk and things like that, but. But um, you know, you know, in some of these large, large construction projects, it's not uncommon to have hundreds, hundreds of heavy equipment vehicles that are that are that are being operated day in and day out. And this one particular company, they started off as using you know um, sensor technology and storage technologies, and, and and a logistics program so that they were just able to keep track of it. And you know, we provided them a Wi-Fi solution that was integrated into a wide area network back to a central data center for, for, for analysis. That's now evolved where they're marketing that solution to construction companies you know, to tell them you know, uh, when maintenance, you know, um, the actual patterns of use, who's using the equipment properly, Who's, uh, who's the most frugal with gasoline, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, so, so th I think there's some very interesting vertical examples that will precede the more, the more B2C or consumer examples. Right. We've, we've traversed a number of uh, trends in this discussion, and uh, I found it a very enjoyable one. We've got one, a, a final question, I think, coming from the audience, which is, uh, what do you think is the number one industry trend that we should be paying attention to? Is, is, is there a killer development uh, that, that ranks above you know, even those that we've talked about today? <laughs> the golden bullet, as it were. Yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, from our perspective, it's secure hybrid networking. Secure hybrid networking. And, and that includes hybrid WAN, which is the integration of the internet with some kind of private in infrastructure like MPLS, okay, and hybrid cloud. And, and you know, knowing how to integrate those two environments, that's, to us, that's the, uh, the, for the next three to five years, the number one area that we're focusing on. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, I tried to put another angle. I agree with Anthony, but I put another angle is that the lumber run trend I observe uh, is, uh, a heavy acquisition and merger mm -hmm. in our industry. So this is a- Further consolidation. Yeah, further consolidation. And the number two, <laughs> I tried to add in the number two mm -hmm. is that, uh, I think there will be highly differentiation in our industry. Some will become a pure infrastructure-based business. Some will be more solution-based. And we think that solution-based some will cooperate with the ODD in a very deep way to penetrate yeah. into the market. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, I must say, you, you've done a, 
a very, very good job of, of chewing on the unknowable uh, today, and uh, it will be fascinating to see uh, uh, where we are next year when we come back to PTC. Ladies and gentlemen, please, will you join me in thanking our panellists today?